Hey there YouTube, Baylor here, and today I want to talk about the Ironclad. Specifically, today I'm going to be teaching you how to defeat the Corrupt Heart, the final boss of Slay the Spire, with the Ironclad here. I'll be doing this by playing a run through here on Ascension 5. This is the, the a, an early stage in the Ascension climb. Devs have stated a couple times that the game's balanced around Ascension 4 specifically. This is when all the enemies in the Spire do their full damage. With one added penalty, deal a little bit less after boss battles. This video is intended to show you tips, tricks, and strategies that you can use to take your ironclad runs all the way to a successful heart win on the early ascension levels of the game. If you're looking for tips on how to defeat the corrupt heart on Ascension 20, I highly recommend the live stream. You can see a link below the video here. Uh, where we attempt to defeat the heart on Ascension 20 almost every day. But here we're playing some Ironclad on Ascension 5, and here's how you can win with the clad. I'll be doing this as a run with uh, no, no starting boon. Normally on a run of Slay the Spire, if you reach the Act 1 boss of your previous run, you'll get four blessings here. But if you fail to get that far, then you'll get only these two starting bonuses. And I'll just probably take uh, a max health bonus for this run. That'll give us a huge amount of health to work with. As the Ironclad, you are the kind of beefiest character in Slay the Spire. A base max health of 80 as well as a burning blood that heals you six at the end of combats means that this character is built to take a hit or two from most enemies while dishing out the damage himself. And the Ironclad starting deck supports that. The Ironclad has six attack cards and four blocks in the starting deck, meaning the Ironclad leans attack heavy. And the characters that you can find on this character, uh, the cards that you can find on this character only kind of push you in that direction even more so. Lots and lots of attacks in the Ironclad's card pool. If you're looking to defeat the heart at the end of Act 4, then you must do two things. You must, one, first and foremost, win a regular run of Slay the Spire. You have to get to the end of Act 3 and win. And that alone is quite a challenge. But in addition to that, we need to pick up three keys that go into the slots in the top left here. Uh, a green key is obtained from fighting an elite with a burning flame symbol on the map. A blue key is obtained from skipping a relic in a chest. And a red key is obtained from skipping an action at a rest site. We'll have to do one of each of these during this run in order to get to Act 4. Knowing when to do each of these can be a bit challenging. The extra difficult elite can prove quite nasty. Missing out on an upgrade or a heal from a rest site can be a problem, and skipping a relic can also put you behind on a run. Generally speaking, in a run of Slay the Spire, especially a run that's trying to go to the heart, your goal in each act is to improve your character, improve your deck of cards, improve the relics that you have in order to achieve something that's more powerful than what you have. If you can gain more strength than the enemies will, you'll stay ahead of the power curve of the game and be able to reap the rewards. So, here in Act 1, we have no relics and just a starting deck of strikes and defends. This won't get us very far. Looking ahead, the first thing you should do at the start of your Ironclad run is take a look at your Act 1 boss. There's three possibilities for this. The slime boss is a big blob. Uh, that's an enemy that's going to split multiple times and will require area damage. There's the Guardian, uh, an angular-looking fellow that, that isn't this. Um, he's uh, going to test our ability to block consistently. But the one that we're facing right here, this gem with six flames around it, is Hexaghost. Hexaghost is a, a damage race of sorts. We'll have to do about 250 damage in nine turns to get past the Act 1 boss. So one of the big things that we need to keep in mind as we go through our Act 1 here is how do the cards before us allow us to do more damage than what we have initially? And there's a couple ways to improve the, the damage of our deck. But 
So one of the first and most important decisions you make in your run of Slay the Spire is which, which node do I start on? I'm using a mod called Map Marks here, which will allow me to mark the map. I'm going to mark our intended path in green to show us where we're going. If your run is looking to defeat the hearts, then you really want to try to accumulate many relics in particular. Each elite that we can defeat will drop not only a relic, but also higher rarity cards and 30 gold um, compared to regular enemies, which drop about 15 and give lower rarity cards. Ironclad's high starting health means he can easily tank a couple of elites early on. So I recommend a path like this that hits these three elites. Um, and we can get there a couple of different ways. Going to a shop with low starting money is usually not recommended, so I think we'll avoid um, going to a store with 99 gold. But it would be re not unreasonable to hit one of these stores um, before you head along this path. If you were looking to feel more dangerous, you could go for the Burning Elite early. Fighting a first elite with no upgrades at a rest site is doable with this character, but not recommended, uh, as you could lose a lot of health to that first elite. So I don't recommend going along this red path. I think this, this green path is going to serve us much, much better overall. Right at the start of Act 1, uh, another thing that I want to note is the distinction between the types of enemy combats. In Act 1, your first three combats, your first three enemy nodes, will contain easy to defeat, low threatened, non-threatening enemies that are, are pretty easy to trounce with the starting deck. Your fourth and subsequent enemy encounter, whether that be from a node on the map that's marked as an enemy or from an unknown space that turns out to contain an enemy. This comes from then the hard pool of encounters, which are more difficult, more numerous enemies that are a bit more of a challenge. You'll want to pick up some cards in your first three combats to help you prepare for the so-called hard pool. I do not recommend visiting too many unknown nodes at the start. In order to get your run started, you really need to improve on the starter deck. Uh, and that means getting card rewards. You do not get card rewards from unknown rooms. Um, and nor do you get potions. And so I think, generally speaking, my rule of thumb is that if you were... Uh, if you still benefit largely from card rewards, or if you have empty potion slots, then it's better to go for a combat than for an event. Usually. So, I'm just going to take 8 max health to start here. We'll show what the chonky, chonky ironclad can do in the starting combats. We get our classic opponent here, the Jaw Worm. My usual rule of thumb for playing the starting combats is that it's worth using your defense to block incoming damage, so long as you block for the full five. If I had a third defend here, for example, I wouldn't play three defends. I would play two defends and one strike, which is what I'm still going to do with this hand. Every combat in Slay the Spire ultimately has to end with your opponent being dead, reduced to zero health. So the way to progress every combat is to deal damage. Most enemies in Slay the Spire will get stronger over time. Um, so this damage first approach where uh, you force an, an end to the confrontations is uh, really going to help out a lot. And also note that as Ironclad, we do heal six at the end of each combat. So as long as we take less than six damage during the fights, uh, we'll be okay here. And here's a, a good moment to, to point out a broad general tip in Slay the Spire. At each turn, consider the deck of cards that you have. Um, we draw five cards every turn, and we're allowed to look at the contents of the draw pile and the discard pile. We know that this is our hand next turn. We draw exactly these five cards. And we'd like to, if possible, let's see, this enemy is 29 health. We're not going to be able to kill no matter what next turn, huh? That's unfortunate. We're going to have to hope we're not being attacked. But yeah, we can do a maximum of 18 damage. I can't bring this enemy below 18 health no matter what I do. Um, but I think I will play this one strike and defend twice. As long as we can win without taking any further damage. And it looks like we're okay here. We can bash strike this turn. And we should be able to kill with two strikes next turn. Yeah, not too bad. And then most of your starting fights as Ironclad should look like that. You 
block for some of, but not all of the incoming damage uh, while playing your attack cards, especially alongside your bash if you can, and then use the Burning Blood to heal back uh, what you missed. Love this early card award. Um, two pretty functional ironclad common attacks, and then one more esoteric card, a card like Burning Pact is uh, one of the cards I would advise staying away from in your first few card awards. What you're looking for in your very first couple of cards are cards that have bigger numbers on them than the strikes and defense. You want to be able to block for more than five or attack for more than six. A card like Burning Pact lets us delete a specific card and then draw more cards. The purpose of the exhaust mechanic on Ironclad is to allow you to essentially get rid of the worst cards in the deck so that you can draw your best cards over and over again. This works really well if you've got a couple good upgraded cards to draw and play. Perfected Strike is a pretty functional early game card, gets better with more copies of it. And Cleave is a way to hit all enemies. I really do advise um, picking up an early damage card, generally speaking. I think that can be quite useful. Uh, an early area damage card, one that can hit multiple enemies. And Cleave is one of the one of the fundamentals on the Ironclad. Cleave, especially with an upgrade, can hit reasonably well. Uh, and there's plenty of ways to make this work a lot better. So I like this as a, an answer to those hard pool encounters we talked about. The more difficult enemies later in Act 1. And this will also probably help us out in the Elite Fights. Slay the Spire is, by and large, a game of answering the problem immediately in front of you. So as you look at the cards in your first couple of combat rewards, the big questions to keep in your mind are, how do these cards help me answer the immediate problems in front of me? And how do these answer the boss of the acts? So Cleave is slightly better than a strike in terms of dealing with Hexaghost, but will help immensely against any multi-enemy encounter we meet up to then. I think you could get away with either Perfected Strike or Cleave. My recommendation is not take Burning Pact here. We also got our first potion, a Thorns Potion, which can return damage to enemies. Usually when I get a potion, uh, th there's kind of two ways that you can use potions and Slay the Spire. You have two main options. Option one is a, as a panic option. If something bad is happening to you in a turn of combat and the effect of the potion can negate that for you, then a potion can be a great answer to that situation. But the other use for potions, the more important use in my mind, is as a specific aid to certain combats. Thorns does a lot of damage to any enemy that attacks multiple times, and that includes, uh, at least as far as enemies that we can see, that includes our act boss here, Hexaghost. So we can set sort of an intention in our mind right now here on floor two. I want to use this liquid bronze to help my help me get through our act one boss. And I think that, and if we then um, keep that intention in mind, we can get a lot done here. Already we're seeing some usefulness of cleave. We've got two enemies, so this deals eight to both of them. Total of 16, very efficient. Might as well finish off this spike slime and then weaken the acid slime so we take no damage there. We've been weakened, so our hand is not enough to kill this thing. We do want to block some of the damage. Again, as long as we take less than six damage, we'll leave the fight at full health. So I think I'm going to bash and defend here. Although you could reasonably strike twice as well. Probably a pretty similar outcome there. Get through another fight at full health. Another cleave, a pommel strike, and a rupture. I really like pommel strike as an early game common for clad does great damage, and the effect of draw one card is very, very valuable in general in a deck builder, um, especially as you get fewer starter cards and more upgraded cards. Pommel Strike is, is really excellent. Rupture can be a, an interesting way to gain strength. Strength is one of the main ways to scale for the later game on the Ironclad. For the first Act and a half, uh, through Act 1 to the middle to end of Act 2, most enemies don't have more than 100 to 150 health. So you can get through those combats by simply playing attack cards repeatedly or using a few damaging effects. But as we get into the later game, we'll face enemies with 300 or more health, um, with not as many turns to do that damage as would be necessary. 
So the further you get into a run of Slay the Spire, the more you need what we tend to call in the community scaling, a way to improve the numeric effects of your cards on later turns of the fight, or just improve the numeric effects of your cards in general so that you can output the huge amounts of block and damage required for the late game. Here at the start, we can we can deal 18 damage or we can block for 15. By the end of this run, we're gonna need to be able to deal 100 damage and block for 50. So we've got a long way to go. Very happy with the Pummel Strike here. I'm gonna pick this Pummel Strike. Currently, we have nothing that damages ourselves for Rupture, but there are some interesting cards that go with Rupture. And we get our first event, which is a pretty good one. The Living Wall. You'll see this one a lot. A very common event in Act 1. Gives you a remove, a transform, or an upgrade. My usual advice for this event is remove a card if you're confident that you're going to beat your Act boss or the immediate challenges. Upgrade a card if you've got an immediate elite that you want to slay or other challenges you need to get through. Um, and transform a card if neither of those things are true. So I think you could very reasonably transform a strike. That could uh, that can turn into pretty much anything from the ironclad character. So this could work out really well or really bad. I think I'm going to go with the more guaranteed outcome here. Let's just actually take an upgrade. If we upgrade our cleave to do more damage to all enemies, and then also upgrade our bash, um, a, a very reasonable early upgrade for this character for one more turn of vulnerable, then we should be able to trounce the first few elite fights and uh, get our relic count going. So I'm just going to improve uh, our damage. Actually, one of the best ways to improve your damage in the early game, let's do the cleave first, is with card upgrades. Simply improving the base value of the cards that you have is some of the best early scaling that Ironclad or any character can get access to. Somewhat of a lousy turn one. Uh -huh. We're being attacked by two high rolled lice here, 16 damage. I can bash and cleave to kill one, or we can cleave and defend twice. Block 10, take 6. Burning Blood would heal the rest, so I think that's what we do. Just cleave, defend, defend. Seems fine to me. Strike him, strike him. Ah, and we're offered our first power of the run. Powers can be very, very... Uh, Powers are a special type of card in Slay the Spire. When you play a power, it doesn't go to your discard like a normal card. Instead, attaching to your character and providing effects, usually every turn for the whole rest of the combat. Uh, Ironclad has a whole bunch of, of different powers, and powers in general are one of the ways to achieve what I call scaling in Slay the Spire. You want a few powers in your deck. Um, uh, powers actually are one of the best ways to answer Slay the Spire's late game, is by putting many, many powers in play. But the heart in particular can be addressed quite well with lots and lots of power cards. But taking too many powers too early in a run of Slay the Spire can backfire. You don't want to be drawing a handful of power cards, because usually power cards have either no or very little immediate effect. Metallicize does have an immediate effect. You do get three block the turn you play it, and actually makes it pretty good here. I would strongly consider a Metallicize in this position. I also like Thunderclap quite a lot because it deals damage to all, uh, applies vulnerable to all enemies, and that can make this cleave do more damage. Vulnerable is on a lot of ironclad cards, makes enemies take 50% more attack damage, and uh, a combination of vulnerable and something like strength can be a way to make your ironclad deck do tons and tons of damage. I think I'm actually going to pick up this early Metallicize, get the first of our uh, sort of long-term block plan going. And we'll stride into one more event, the Golden Idol. Here you will come across a, a Golden Idol. This Golden Idol will give you bonus money for the rest of the run if you take it, but you must accept a downside. You trigger a trap. Your choice of a curse, damage to your face, or losing max health. Currently, we have tons and tons of health to spare. I think we're going to be get able to get away with taking the 22 damage here and not losing any maximum health. Um, but if we wanted to lose less current health, we could lose the 7 max HP. Usually on higher ascensions, this is what you'll see me choose, is lose 7 max health. Here, I think we should take 22, keep our 88 max health, 
go down to 66, which still should be plenty of health to get through uh, the first few elites. There are many, many events in Act 1 that will damage you, the player, in order to get some rewards. Uh, I do recommend avoiding them early in the act, partially for that reason. You don't want to be trading all of your health away right away before you actually become strong. All right, the next upgrade here will be Bash. We'll upgrade that to be two more immediate damage, which matters only a little, but it's the extra turn of Vulnerable that is very important. Consider that as a two-cost attack, when you play Bash, you can really only play one more attack on the turn you played it. Uh, so it's mostly the turn after you play Bash where you can do the bonus damage. Upgrading the Bash means you have two turns of useful vulnerable rather than one. Uh, and that can be a really nice starter upgrade for the clad. Other upgrades that are pretty good here, the Pummel Strike deals one more damage and draws one more card. That extra card draw, very, very good for later on. And I think upgrading Metallicize for one more block per turn is pretty good. Usually I don't recommend improving your defense or strikes. As my rule of thumb, usually when I'm looking at upgrades and considering what card to upgrade, I consider the raw total numerical value of the upgrade. Don't look at percentage, for example. Strike going from 6 to 9 is a 50% increase, but that's not as relevant as that it, the fact that it's just plus 3. Our first enemy ends up being the Sentries. There are three different elites that you can fight each act. You won't be fighting the same elite ever twice in a row, uh, but you can fight the same elite multiple times in one act. This is a fight where we're very happy to have upgraded Cleave, hitting each of these for 11. We're also pretty happy to have Metallicize, giving us block every turn. I think I want to Metallicize, Cleave, and then maybe Pummel Strike does the most damage. In this fight in particular, you want to kill one of the three sentries as quick as possible. I usually recommend... Um, usually recommend going for the one with the lowest health, which is this guy in the back here. So that's the one I'm gonna target here. We're gonna Pummel Strike that one, bring it to 18, so that we can kill it with three strikes potentially next turn, and put our Metallicize in play to get three block. It's pretty expected that you take some damage. Hey, we do get the, the, the kill here quite cleanly. Strike this nerd three times. Very expected that you take some damage in your first elite fight. Especially as Ironclad, again, that's what the Burning Blood is for. Let's see, 11 plus 10. Cannot kill this sentry. But we're definitely hitting them both. I think what we didn't want to do in this position is strike the front one. Um, we have 12 cards in the draw pile. Any two damage cards would kill it. So, uh, picking 5 from 12. Decent chance of a kill there. You could do some math to determine the exact odds that you kill this one on this turn. Um, but we've managed to get there. Okay, so this fight went pretty cleanly. We managed to kill the sentries dead, rewarded with lots of money from the Golden Idol, as well as a Gremlin Horn, remembering that uh, and it, il, norm, elites drop more money than regular enemies, and with a 25% more from Golden Idol, we're getting a double bonus there. This Gremlin Horn Relic will make any fight with multiple enemies easier to handle from here on out. I really like the Gremlin Horn in Act 2, especially. We're offered our first rare card of the run, Exhum, which gets us back an exhausted card. We're also offered a Pummel Strike, number 2. Or a Dual Wheel, which can allow us to make copies of an attacker power card. It's kind of interesting. Dual Wielding Cleave or Dual Wielding Metallicize can be rather interesting. Pretty happy with the second Pummel Strike. Dual Wield is a fairly energy-hungry card. You want to be able to play the copies that you create. Uh, and with here only three base energy per turn at the start of the run, it's kind of difficult to afford Dual Wield. But it could be a card that becomes useful later on, especially if we upgrade the Dual Wield. I think I'm just going to pick more attacks here. We still need to be able to do more damage to Hexaghost, even with the Liquid Bronze. We're not there yet. So I'll take another Pummel Strike for more direct damage and to draw. And I think I am going to upgrade our Metallicize for a little bit more block per turn before we start upgrading these Pummel Strikes. Our first mid-act chest. These chests are the ones that contain the Sapphire Key. We'll need to take... Uh, take this in lieu of one of the relics that were offered this run. 
The Bottled Flame is a pretty good candidate for taking the Sapphire Key over. Bottled Flame gives, lets us choose one of our attacks to always be in our opening hand. Bottling Bash Plus is actually not bad, admittedly. Getting vulnerable down on turn one of every fight is reasonable, but could come to bite us later in the run. Usually, in this situation, I would take the Sapphire Key so that I can get better relics later, but there is some consideration for what helps right now, and having guaranteed turn one bash is good against our remaining elites and against the boss. So, this is worth thinking about to bottle bash. You know what? Let's do it. Let's see how it goes. Guaranteed turn one vulnerable is pretty decent here. So our second elite is the Lagavulin. This egg enemy sleeps for up to three turns. Uh, we're just going to wake them up by bashing them in the face, though. With that upgraded bash, we put it into our opening hand for a reason. Unfortunately, the Pommel Strike draws the Metallicize, which I would have hoped to play for this first set of attacks from this enemy, but oh well. So, huge attacks from this enemy. We're not going to be able to block for all of this, no matter what. And ultimately, this fight is a damage race. The Legavulin will debuff our strength and dexterity, our, uh, our stats, on our character every few turns. So we want to make sure that we can put a decisive end to this fight pretty quickly here. I think that means I probably want to Pummel Strike over Cleaving. Uh, over Defending, rather. Play Pummel Strike, Cleave, one Defend this turn, rather than two Defends. Oh, there's Metallicize. Okay, we'll play the Metallicize over Defend. Still Cleave here. And then on this turn, we can bash Pummel Strike. And I think we can deal enough damage to kill next turn. It's gonna be close here. Just barely with three strikes. Spicy. So we get 26 gold and the Matroshka Relic. This says our next two non-boss chests contain two relics each. Kind of exciting news. More relics is going to be more better later on. We're offered a third Pummel Strike. There's also an Anger, a zero-cost self-duplicating card. I really like Anger on the Ironclad, especially if you've got lots of card draw. Anger can be a really good early common attack. Its self-duplicating nature also makes it really helpful in fights where the enemy adds unwanted status cards to your deck, like our upcoming act boss, the Hexaghost. So I think for those two reasons, I'm going to pick Anger here. Notably, this Perfected Strike is also quite good, because we now have seven cards labeled Strike in the deck, which means this does quite a lot of damage. It's also worth considering here. Usually speaking, I prefer Anger for perf over Perfected Strike for a heart run, or for any longer run. I'm going to let that instinct guide me here. But I think you could reasonably take either of those cards. The Twin Mushrooms. Here's a fight for Grumlin Horn. Let's show them uh, what for Grumlin Horn. Hiya! And then we can go Pummel Strike, Anger. Look at that. Turn one kill. And that's kind of the place you want your deck to be going. Now that we have a couple of added cards, now that we have a couple of upgraded cards, the deck is performing much better than Strikes and Defends. My rule of thumb is about five added cards in an act. Once, you, once you've hit five added cards in Act 1, it's pretty difficult to benefit from additional cards. However, we're offered some premium ones here. Option A, Shockwave, applies weak and vulnerable to all enemies. This can be some nice lengthy debuffs to your opponent. True Grit could be part of a longer term block plan, allowing us to exhaust cards strategically. But against any run that's going to the heart specifically, uh, I do highly recommend the first copy of Disarm. Disarm is permanent strength reduction, which will not only help against our Hexaghost, but this is thinking in the, the much, much longer term. Um, Disarm will help us against the heart. I'd say when you're doing a heart run, you probably want to keep your decision making about 80% or 90% for what's right in front of you, and then 10 or 20%, like, is this going to be useful much, much, much later on against Act 4? Uh, and Disarm is, is definitely a card that has both immediate and long-term utility, which makes me really like it in this position. Strongly recommend the first Disarm you see on any Ironclad run that's going to the heart. 
So we'll pick this one up. One time strength reduction, good stuff. Let's see, we do have an empty potion slot, which makes combats still pretty decent here. Um, but now that we've we've got enough added cards to the deck, it's a bit less desirable to take fights now. So I think we should take an event over a combat here uh, and see what this is. This could be a shop, it could be a chest. In this case, it's a serpent offering us money in exchange for a curse. You're offered curses a few times in a run of Slay the Spire. I usually do not recommend taking curses unless you can either block the curse immediately with the Omomori Relic. Quick little tip here. Every time you're offered a curse, take a quick look at your uh, your relic bar and see if there's a, a red tag that blocks curses, the Omomori. We don't have that, nor do we have a shop where we could spend this money. So this would mean taking a curse, uh, which will make us worse in combat. So that's something to think about. Any Anytime you have a curse in your deck, you're going to be taking more damage during fights. So view this as a, a constant negative resource that's being applied to your run. In that case, I think we should disagree with the Serpent. Don't take his stinky deal. And we'll proceed into the next fight here. Red Slaver. Pretty low health. Won't take long for us to kill this man, but at the same time, does a lot of damage up front. I think this is a bash defend turn. Could do bash cleave all out offense here. And sometimes that is the right play with the Ironclad. Let's see, 36 health. We can reasonably do 27. I guess if I drew three strikes and anger, we could kill. Um, but if I bring him down to 20, we're almost guaranteed to kill next turn. So the question is, how much damage would I take next turn? I think the answer is not very much. So we'll block here. Actually, what I should have done was disarm this turn, rather than playing all three attacks. Either way, we, we blocked five last turn, we take five this turn. I think it came out the same either way, whether we played Cleave or not turn one in this fight. Headbutt's an early uh, favorite of mine. Headbutt lets us just put a particular card back on top of the deck. I really like Headbutt uh, for allowing us to set up useful combos later in the run. Kind of a, a just I can I consider this a glue card on Ironclad. Twin Strike and Clash deal appreciable damage. I mean, these are all damage cards, and realistically, we don't need any more once we've added about four. As long as you can draw three damage cards to spend your energy on, there's not much use to having more of it. But I do think I like Headbutt here. Putting a card back on top, especially when I can immediately redraw that card with the two Pummel Strikes, becomes quite useful. Alright, one more Elite this act. We've, we're getting kind of low on health, but bear in mind that this Blood Potion can heal us for 20%. We end up fighting the Sentries a second time, and I'd say that's probably a good thing here. Now that we got the Gremlin Horn from beating them the first time, we'll gain card draws and energy as they die this time. Let's use Anger to make a new copy of itself. Again, targeting the back one here with the least health. They just randomly rolled that way both times. And rather than playing the Bash for a mere 10 damage, this artifact effect on the enemies will block the vulnerables. The Bash won't do much there. Let's play two blocks instead. And our goal this turn is to kill this sentry, which we can do with the cards in our hand. That way we'll draw a card and gain an energy back with the Gremlin Horn. Then I can play either Metallicize or Defend, or if I draw it, Cleave. Okay, let's do Metallicize. So we take six on this turn. This turn we can Cleave, Strike, Defend, take one more. Definitely want to play the Cleave here, for sure Z's. Again, Disarm gets blocked by the Artifact Charge, just like the Vulnerable did. And I think we should focus on the one with lower health here. Um, we can play all of this. This deals 21 plus 6, 27 damage. So I can kill this one, but not this one. Um, nothing to headbutt. Let's try to draw a block card then. Could also put Anger on the top of the deck and draw into it, but I want the chance that that's a block card. It's not. Go relatively low on health here. 
Taking damage is a part of playing Slay the Spire, especially playing Ironclad. If you get low on health, try not to get discouraged. Because there's always a way out of the current situation. Very intriguing set of card rewards here. These are all in amongst the more esoteric of Ironclad's cards. Not usually ones I recommend early, although I do think Reckless Charge as a zero-cost attack has some utility. But Havoc randomly playing the top card of your deck is a bit weird for one energy. Combust would cost us health. I don't think we have um, any of that to give. Mostly, I think this would play Havoc with our deck. We did get a Fruit Juice for five max health. We're not going to drink that quite yet. Uh, we'll want to get through the Hexagos fight first, as we could get a boss relic that doubles the effectiveness of this. But I wouldn't blame you for drinking that Fruit Juice for the five max HP right away. Instead, we're going to go into the Hexagos fight with this deck of cards. We never saw any strength that would improve our damage. One of the major ways to scale Ironclad is with the strength stat. And against Hexaghost, I do highly recommend it, but um, sometimes you'll just never get offered strength early as clad, and that's okay. In this case, what's going to carry us through the fight is our upgraded Bash for more vulnerable turns, the upgraded base damage of the Cleave, and this Liquid Bronze, which we deliberately said when we picked it on floor two would help us against our boss. That's actually going to be quite crucial here. We'll skip all the rest. If we felt like we needed even more damage, I could arguably take and then upgrade the Combust, but that's going to require a lot of health to, uh, to make work. This particular boss has an attack that is based on your current health, the start of the fight. So Hexaghost as a boss is often recommended to be fought at a lower health here. We've got health potions that we can use if we get into a pickle. So in this situation, I strongly recommend that we upgrade a card over resting. If we're fighting either of the other Act 1 bosses, we'd probably want to rest here for more health to defeat our boss. Um, but in this case, we get to upgrade, and I think upgrading Disarm to further reduce Hexaghost's damage is a good idea. Between the upgraded Disarm and the upgraded Metallicize, we should have a lot of passive block against this enemy. So that's going to be my choice there. We are, like I said, going to Liquid Bronze turn one. And I'm also going to play the Disarm on turn one. That should cause us to actually take zero damage next turn. A little bit of a shame that we drew all of the damage cards turn one here. I'd, I'd like to be able to, to play these with the Vulnerable of the Bash, but we have to play the Disarm. So we'll just go Bash and Anger. We definitely want to play Anger every time we draw it to get more attacks into the deck. Against this pathetic multi-hit, all we get to do is damage. Just pummel strike twice, draw closer to that metallicize. Next turn, we metallicize and two strikes. And uh, we're kind of off to the races here. Again, the goal is to kill this boss before all of their flames ignite again. After that times six attack on turn two, uh, each of these flames will light up one by one with each turn that passes. And when all flames are relit, that's when things get troublesome for the player. So you want to do as much damage as you can, as quickly as you can, um, or else. So here, for example, we can either defend, take two damage, or rather, we can strike, deal six, take two, or we can defend a full block. I think we should take the two damage to deal the six, because this fight is really all about making sure we deal as much damage as we can. Shame to draw the Angers before the Bash, but this looks fine. We'll go Anger, Anger, Cleave. Um, next turn, we're not being attacked, so we can draw a Bash next turn. Let's put an Anger back on top. Just keep playing these free attack cards. Play all the damage there. Perfect. Bash. Anger. And Pommel Strike. Pommel Strike draws a Blur... Blur? A Burn, but our Metallicize blocks it, no problem. All right, we're running out of time. Do want the Vulnerable to keep going, so I think we play Bash this turn and defend once. Take one damage. Strikes won't deal any damage, because Hexaghost has block. So let's do this. Take one more. Again, we can use the Health Potion if we need to. And we should be able to kill here with our attacks. Perfect. Kind of cleanly killing Hexagos just in time. And that's, again, the, the upgraded bash plus a, an upgraded attack. Uh, and again, the bronze scales all kind of combining to be just enough damage there. 
Now we're offered some rare cards. From Ironclad, you always get offered three rares after beating a boss, and the rares that you pick can really shape your run. Got some very interesting ones here. Barricade. This can be a card around which you build a deck. Barricade means our block won't be removed at the start of each turn. We can accumulate it from turn to turn. That works best with decks that can get a lot of block up front. Currently, this deck is a bit short on block, uh, although we can get a small amount of block many times. If you wanted immediate block, Impervious goes a long way. 30 block for two energy. What I like about Impervious is that this card is, is numerically valued just high enough to almost perfectly block everything in Act 2. So this card is very good in Act 2 specifically. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, Juggernaut here. Every time we gain block, deal damage to a random enemy. Juggernaut's a bit expensive as far as uh, damaging powers go, but it can be quite powerful. Juggernaut is best in decks that can deal a small amount of uh, can generate a small amount of block multiple times, and a metallicize in this deck does help make Juggernaut a, a lot better. So I think this is actually a, a somewhat takeable Juggernaut. Although I'd probably rate the Impervious as the best, Juggernaut as the second best, and then Barricade as kind of a distant third here. Barricade not doing a whole lot for this deck right now, although this could be a part of our heart plan later. I'm cool with either Impervious or Juggernaut. Currently, this deck is is struggling to figure out how to do more damage in the long term. Um, and Juggernaut would help a lot with the more damage part of this. But uh, Impervious would be a very good block source. Would Skip be better than Barricade currently? Um, probably, at least in terms of getting through the fights of Act 2. I think by the time we reach the Act 2 boss, the Barricade would be be pretty good. I think we should take a, a Juggernaut from here, honestly. This deck already wants to put more block into it. Um, and if we can turn that block into damage, I, I think this will be pretty good. So let's take a Juggernaut. I actually think Juggernaut can be a very useful power against Heart too. Well, this is an interesting set of choices. Going into Act 2, you'll have a set, uh, a choice of three boss relics. Some of these boss relics give you energy per turn in exchange for a downside. In this case, Ectoplasm is the energy relic that we're offered. We can no longer gain gold, which is a pretty hefty downside. Not something that I particularly strongly recommend here. Uh, especially because we're getting bonus gold from the Golden Idol. If we were to take Ectoplasm, four energy per turn is definitely going to help the deck slap pretty hard in terms of Act 2, but we'll fall behind in the long term. Tiny House gives us just kind of a bunch of stuff. A potion, 50 gold, 5 max health, 1 card pick, and 1 upgrade. That's fine. All of these help a, a little bit, but none of them individually do a whole lot. But the last option, Black Blood, turns our Burning Blood into a heal 12 every fight, which is pretty juicy. That'll help us continue to um, take hits while dishing them out and continue to stay healthy throughout the act. I, I, the idea with Black Blood is that you just heal your way through whatever act that you're in and then arrive at the boss with a, a lot of health to uh, to face them. I think Black Blood's pretty good here, actually. I, I think I would take Black Blood over Ectoplasm, although I wouldn't blame anybody who wanted that fourth energy. Uh, I think, it, especially in a heart run, you can get more use out of the money. Tiny House is not bad, though. I think, uh, I think this could be quite useful, but let's Let's make it a true ironclad run and uh, take the heal 12 each fight. All right, so here in act two, we have to again, think about the path that we want to take. First thing to, to look at as before is the act boss. This is the collector, a boss that summons multiple minions. This is where the gremlin horn is going to come in quite handy. Uh, as well as applies major debuffs to us. So if we can find any way to avoid or mitigate debuffs, um, weak, vulnerable, and frail, that could help quite a bit, as well as more sources of area damage. We'd also like to continue to accumulate money and relics by beating elites. Maybe consider going for the burning elite this act. Um, and another thing that we should probably do is hit a store and spend some money. Once you have about 300 gold, shops become pretty good in Slay the Spire, because you can buy anything in a shop with about 300 bucks. 
So I think we should start by taking a couple fights and then visiting this store. From there, we can consider fighting many more elites. And I do think we're pretty well equipped against the elites of the act. So I'd like to head over and like kill these elites or something like that. We could even maybe consider going again for the burning elite. We'll talk about that when we finish beating this one, how strong we are. So I'm going to mark the burning elite in red. If we can, if we can seize the opportunity to kill it, we probably should. Um, but otherwise, it might be better safely left for next act. So the Act 2 boss, generally speaking, in any run of Slay the Spire, is your first major test of scaling. Against the Act 2 boss, we're going to have to prove that we can not just do, you know, 100 damage, but rather do 300 damage. That's about the health the Collector has, plus more to the minions. We're going to need to find either ways to get more energy or cards that are a lot more effective in order to try to make that happen. So let's start into our first fight here in Act 2. Act 2 encounters are a lot tougher than what you've faced previously. Generally speaking, a good rule of thumb for these fights is 100 damage across 3 turns. If you can, with your deck, deal 100 damage in 3 turns, then you can easily beat most of the enemies in Act 2. Currently, this deck cannot do that. Uh, we just don't have enough energy. I'm going to play my attacks here. Skip the disarm. What is this? Cleave, defend, defend. This enemy is about to make us frail, and then we'll take a, a pretty nasty hit next turn, unless we can deal another 63 damage, which seems pretty impossible, right? We can do Cleave, Strike, Strike for 23, bringing it to 40. There's no way for me to do 40 damage next turn, so we always have to take a hit. And Maybe that impl involves using our Speed Potion. We'll see. But ultimately, that's what the Black Blood is for. We have to take some hits from our opponent's in order to come ahead in the fight. I think what we should do is try to kill this thing by the end of next turn. 52 damage over two turns. We're guaranteed 18. Let's assume I can do 24 next turn. Well, that won't be enough. Hmm. Well, let's headbutt an anger and see where we end up. I think we'll be able to kill. Definitely want to play the metallicize. And then do we block or strike? I think we strike. Uh, we should probably drink this fruit juice sometime soon as well. Okay, there's no way that this kills, right? Unfortunately not. We're just a bit shy here. Do I strike again or defend? This enemy's about to gain 15 block. We'd like to kill it next turn. I think that means we strike. Note that we've lost a lot of health here. 11 plus 10, 21. This enemy has 22 health. Of course it does. Uh-oh. <laughs> are we one short of a kill here? I think we are. That's a bit of a bummer. I guess we play Juggernaut and defend then. Probably should have played Juggernaut earlier in this fight. Take another big hit here. Go down to 31 health. It hurts, but we're finally through the fight intact. That Black Blood healing us 12 is going to help. We're offered another upgraded cleave. Now that we're in Act 2, it's possible for us to find upgraded cards. This is part of the reason I don't advocate adding too many cards in Act 1. Uh, is because upgraded cards can start appearing later on. I think Cleave Plus is actually excellent here. There's a lot of multi-enemy fights in the Act, uh, including our Act boss. And with the Gremlin Horn, we're going to appreciate the ability to kill more enemies. Flex Plus, to give us temporary strength, can also be helpful here. Flex is a bit of an unusual ironclad card. Temporary strength is not quite the same thing as permanent strength, but there are ways to make it quite useful. I'm taking that cleave, because I think it's quite good. And we're going to end up in another difficult fight here. This is the Shelled Parasite, who will attack quite relentlessly. They have a, a large amount of block each turn with their plated armor. Uh, and this will turn into a difficult, prolonged situation. Fortunately, Disarm and Metallicize do a lot of work here. Um, I think we'll hold on to this fruit juice a little bit longer. There might be a relic in the store that changes things for us. Uh, for now, we just want to block. Unfortunately, we can't... Uh, I don't think we should play Bash there on turn one. We just want to focus on getting our powers and such in play here. The Disarm and the Metallicize especially. That should stop our health hemorrhaging. 
There's the disarm. I could headbutt a defend here. Although I won't be able to play it, so there's no point. Just pummel strike. Anger. Headbutt. B. Defend? So that I can block next turn. A metallicized juggernaut. A metallicized defend will do. Fortunately, we just don't have the energy to easily get um, a juggernaut in play. Which is definitely a challenge here. But you can see that with the reduced strength from the disarm and the auto block from the metella size, we're doing okay. If not particularly good here. Alright, defend, cleave twice. Every time we hit this thing, the plated armor drops, so it'll get less and less block each turn, kind of allowing us to gradually wear it down. If not in dramatic fashion. You definitely feel that this deck is struggling a little bit. We're not quite where we want to be, but we are doing okay for the time being. I'll drink this blood potion to pick up the dupe pot. No, we'll drink up the fruit juice to pick up the blood, the duplication potion. We're offered a true grit, an evolve, and a carnage. I like adding a block card now that we've got Juggernaut. It's not an upgraded true grit, but it is a block card. Trigit gives us block and exhausts a card at random. And I think this is going to be an essential part of how this deck progresses from here. And one of the best ways that we can improve the Juggernaut power is with an ironclad power called Feel No Pain, giving us block per card exhaust. We're always offered a power in a store, so there could have been a Feel No Pain here. Instead, there's a Metallicize. Oh, but there is something I really, really like here in this shop. Actually, there's quite a few things I really, really like here in this shop. So, shop layout is always the same. There are two attack cards from your character, two skill cards from your character, one power from your character, an uncommon colorless card, a rare colorless card, three relics, and three potions. Relics here are pretty useful. Centennial Puzzle gives us card draw the first time we lose health each fight. The Red and Needle giving us four plated armor. That's four block each turn. And Frozen Eye lets us view the cards in the draw pile. Uh, I actually really like this Thread Needle. Four Plated Armor is another source of block, which will make the Juggernaut deal more damage per turn. It's one of many, many relics that uh, that kind of interact with block effects. The, the actual block itself won't be that important, but uh, it's pretty good. Second copy of Metallicize here won't actually help with the Juggernaut. Multiple copies of Metallicize will combine into one stack. So if we play the Metallicize Plus and the regular Metallicize, that'll be gain seven block in one instance at the end of the turn. And then the Juggernaut will only do damage one time. Something else here that's very, very valuable, card removal. At shops, you can remove cards. And I strongly recommend getting rid of the starter cards, strikes or defends. Usually strikes, especially with the Juggernaut here. We want to remove strikes over defends. Um, but regardless, getting rid of some of your starter cards is, is absolutely essential, especially if you want your run to go the distance here. I am going to pick up this thread needle. Do we drink the blood potion, take a fire potion into these early elite fights? I think the answer is yes. Let's drink this blood potion now. We can drink a blood potion at any time, and we'll spend our last money on a fire potion here. If we want to be able to su survive elite combats... Uh, in the near future. A little bit of extra damage goes a long way, especially when that fire potion can activate Gremlin Horn and give us some energy. Our next opponent here is the Sneko. Sneko will confuse us, making our cards cost random amounts. That could be good or bad. There's no way to know for sure. Uh, but either way, we're going to have to put an end to this fight swiftly. Alright, we definitely want to lower this enemy's strength. And I'd like to keep my health intact here, if possible. All right, Metallicize, show them what for. Now, getting eight block per turn. And with Juggernaut, that'll deal damage at the end of the turn twice. You'd love to see it. No block other than that, unfortunately, so we do take some life loss here. Look at that, we dish it out in equal measure, too.
So here's the now the Juggernaut really starting to show its its utility here, hitting for damage twice per turn, plus once per block card that we play. It means we can kill enemies pretty quickly here. We're offered a third cleave. This one's not upgraded. I think, generally speaking, unupgraded attacks are not that helpful anymore, especially with no strength gain. All right, so I'm not going to take any of those cards. I think it's time to go to this elite fight. We should be able to win pretty well here, but we have one more event first. Ooh, the Ancient Writing allows us to either remove one card from the deck or upgrade all of our strikes and all of our defends making them plus three each. My usual uh, recommendation for this event, if you're getting maybe five or more upgrades, then upgrading is better than removing. In this case, we're getting eight upgrades, which is very, very good. These eight upgrades will help us get through the act intact. We'll be able to beat the elites easier. We'll be able to beat the act boss easier. So this is a clear upgrade all to me. Let's take it. All right, I think we can handle this, this first elite fight. We've got lots of health. We've got three good potions. We have a good set of relics. We're facing down the Book of Stabbing, a foe that uh, increases in power every turn. Fortunately, we have Disarm to reduce their stabbing strength. And I think Juggernaut is gonna be most of our damage in this fight. Any effect in Slay the Spire that deals damage to a random target is effectively a good single target damage source. Because the randomness of the target is irrelevant here. Really wish we had that Thorns Potion still. Might end up using our Duplication Potion on the Juggernaut here, especially since we've bottom decked it so hard. This is a bit tough. Let's see, I'm going to headbutt a block card next turn. I'm going to play Juggernaut and a block card. Um, let's go cleave, headbutt the defend plus, and Trigret will destroy one of these strikes in addition to blocking for a bunch. We do take some damage here. All right, still lots and lots of health left on this book. We need this thing to die, and I think that's where Duplication Potion comes in. This turn, our next card is played twice. We're going to Duplication Potion our Juggernaut power, and this should give us the damage we need to win this fight. 10 damage per instance of block. So 10 from that, 20 at the end of the turn. We'll headbutt that as much as we can as well. And of course, we're also uh, healing 12 after this fight ends too. All right, the book dies. We get an Omomori, which will negate the next two curses we would pick up. That's not too bad. Could consider Iron Wave here. It's an attack that blocks, which would activate Juggernaut, but unupgraded, I'm pretty unenthused. Sword Boomerang and Heavy Blade are cards for strength, which is not the direction we're going. We're kind of going more down the blocking interactions of Ironclad, just because we haven't seen the strength, really. No demon forms, no inflames this run. Did we get strong enough to go for that Burning Elite? We know this is either Gremlin Leader or the Three Slavers. With a buff of some kind. Won't be a plus strength Book of Stabbing. I do feel more comfortable going into the Burning Elite knowing that this can't be the Book of Stabbing. I don't really want to go to that second shop. Yeah, actually, I think fighting another Elite is reasonable here. We get to upgrade a card first. The True Grid upgrade is quite nice, so I can choose the card we lose. Um, I could also upgrade the Pummel Strike for more card draw. Actually, no, we should upgrade Juggernaut, probably. Yeah, let's upgrade the Juggernaut. And I'm gonna go for the Burning Elite. We're gonna grab the green key here. We're doing this, hopefully, with the power of the Gremlin Horn helping us out. Yeah, so for example, we're fighting these three nerds. The Three Slavers, they're called. The buff they got is Regeneration, so they'll each heal each turn, which is pretty nasty. But as long as we can kill one of them quickly, this will go pretty well. Let's see, Bash plus Cleave deals 26, 46. Cannot quite kill one of them turn one. That is a bit spooky. 
They do a total of 34 damage to us on turn one. This middle one, so in this fight, you've got three separate threats. The front guy will weaken you, the middle one will add wounds to the deck, and the back one will either make you vulnerable or entangle you, preventing you from attacking. Almost always, the back guy is the real threat here, and the one you want to kill immediately. Um, I think what we want to do is headbutt our cleave so we can strike them all again next turn. I'll do 20 to you. And then play one defend. Block 12. Take a bunch. Could use the speed potion to block for five more. Heck, I could speed potion, double defend, and take almost nothing here. Um, but really, this fight needs to end in, in the Red Slaver dying quickly. So let's headbutt cleave to make that happen. We'll plan on using the fire potion to kill next turn, hopefully. And I'm just going to eat this damage. It's okay if we end up needing to rest soon. We've got lots and lots of health. That's kind of the ironclad way. Take damage to deal damage. Double cleave. The recleavening. Eleven, huh? Yeah, you die now, sir. Okay. Let's try to avoid losing too much more health. Disarming the middle one's probably a good idea. I think we'll be fighting the middle slaver for a while here. Um, we want to kill the front guy very shortly. I'm going to disarm you and True Grit. We should be able to kill next turn with three attacks on the blue slaver, if we draw them anyway. 996, not quite. Whoops. All right, let's go blocking then. This middle guy literally can't hurt us once the uh, front one is dead because his strength doesn't increase on this ascension level and we automatically block for four so we're now invulnerable to the, the remaining slaver. We can kill him at our leisure here. Bit of a tricky fight but we get through it just fine. We still have one of our potions left. Let's uh, headbutt the juggernaut and that can automatically kill him. You can really see we've struggled to put the Juggernaut in play. We're going to have to change that if you want to win. We get a Vajra here. Plus one strength means all our attacks will do one more damage. That's not too bad. Could take a Fiend Fire. Another rare card being offered. Fiend Fire lets us exhaust everything in our hand in order to deal damage based on the number of cards. Fiend Fire can also be a useful way to get rid of unwanted cards like statuses or starter cards. And if we find other exhaust synergies later on in the run, I think that the Fiend Fire will help us a lot. So I, I think this is something we should pick up. This will give us more, more ability to exhaust cards, kind of building towards, again, an Ironclad's exhaust synergy. That'll let us pick up powers like Feel No Pain or Dark Embrace that are a bit better. So again, this is more of a, a long-term pick than a short-term pick, but it does have some short-term utility. Black Blood helpfully keeping us alive here. Uh, the, definitely the bonus healing is coming in clutch. Definitely love a strawberry. Now we're up to 100 max HP. So chunky. And again, offered a relic versus the blue key. The smooth stone makes our blocks block for one more, which is pretty good. We already want to block because of the juggernaut. So a little bit more block will help us uh, stay alive a bit better. Could be that the random relic we're going to get in Act 3 is better than this, but I think I'm going to take the Smooth Stone for now. It's another useful common relic. Definitely got... So we're starting to get a critical mass of relics here, and this is why I advocate fighting so many elites, especially on a run that's trying to beat the heart, because once you get enough relics, you can do just about anything. Good old snake plant. Um, we'll draw one, sure. Snake plant has a nasty... 8x3 multi-attack that they'll do regularly. Hopefully we'll find a disarm so we can shut them down. Another easy way to end this fight is just kill them quickly, but that can be tough to do. Dang it, disarm. Where you at? Right, defend, cleave, lose a strike. Block for 19, take 5. Let's go uh, Juggernaut and actually cleave. That should kill this thing before it can attack us again. Disarm showed up a bit too late here. All right, we actually gained health from that fight. 
Shrug it off feels pretty good in this deck. We get bonus block with the Smooth Stone, and it'll do damage with the Juggernaut. Uh, really starting to lead towards our, our late game scaling plan here. Give me that shrug. All right, 50 health seems like it's probably enough, but we could reasonably get 30 more here. Resting is not a bad idea. We don't have that many good upgrades. I guess True Grit's a pretty decent one. Fiend Fire is a pretty good upgrade. Uh, actually, yeah, let's upgrade Fiend Fire to the 10 damage per card in hand. That's a very substantial power upgrade. We also have this Blessing of the Forge potion, which allows me to upgrade anything in my hand. Classic Knight Centurion Fight. Or, uh, Centurion Mystic Fight, excuse me. These two uh, RPG rejects. Uh, you'll often encounter in Act 2. Highly recommend going for the Armored Knight first, believe it or not. Although, gaming instincts might tell you to go for the Mystic first. Uh, the mechanics of this fight mean that it is usually easier to kill the Centurion first than to kill the Mystic first. So I'm going to focus all of my damage on the Knight here and try to KO them before they do a whole lot, which looks like we managed to deal here. And bust uh, the, the Juggernaut now. Put that in play with the Gremlin Horn. Easy. Good job, Gremlin Horn. Then once the Mystic is on her own, she's pretty easy pickings for really anything. Not bad. So we actually healed quite a bit off that fight. Clothesline plus. I actually quite like that. Currently this deck has no access to weakness, which makes enemies do 25% less damage. Clothesline is a perfectly fine ironclad common for delivering weak. I think it's ex exceptionally useful in the late game, starting around your act two boss. Uh, think of the weak status as scaling block. The more damage your enemy does, the more block weakness provides. And going into Act 4 and the Heart, we're really going to want a card like this. Usually I advocate for the Ironclad card Shockwave, but with the free upgrade offered here, I don't think we should refuse this clothesline. Alright, Book of Stabbing rematch. Hopefully we'll draw a Juggernaut a little earlier this time. We'll see. This early bash has uh, been more and more of a problem. There's Juggernaut. So I can go Juggernaut Shrug, or... We do other stuff that isn't that. No, let's just go Juggernaut Shrug. Try to get that Disarm soon. There it is. Disarm, Defend, Trigrit should be most of the block we need. We lose our Plated Armor. Which is a bit sad, but not too sad. Man, I wish I could Fiend Fire. Probably more like Clothesline, Defend, Metallicize feels important, too. Could do Defend, Metallicize, Pummel Strike. But I, I think we should get the Weakened down. So let's go Defend, Clothesline. Or even maybe Metallicize, Clothesline. I take a lot more. But having the Metallicize in play is pretty important. Let's just put the power in play. Get some more wounds and such, but... You know how it is. Bash. Anger. Really need that damage per turn from the Juggernaut Metallicized interaction. Not having a duplication for potion for this fight has made it a bit more difficult. If I headbutt here, then the Juggernaut from the Metallicize will kill, so we're through. Okay, that wasn't too bad. We get a Lantern for one more energy on turn one. That can really help with um, getting the Juggernaut in play, potentially, or even just playing our Bottled Bash. Limit Break's a great card for strength decks, but again, this run has just not seen any strength. And again, that happens on Ironclad runs sometimes. We're, we're trying to figure out a, a different way to victory. You could still pick this up and then try to find strength later. There's lots of good, um, good cards with strength that we could pick up, uh, and the, even ones that we have, like the Fiendfire and the Anger. And it does double our one strength from Bajra. That's right, we have one strength already, so this would go to two. This is borderline takeable, but definitely not necessary here. I'll skip. Don't want to take too many cards in a run of Slay the Spire. Every card that you add has a cost of one draw, in addition to whatever the energy cost is. The more cards there are, the longer it takes you to draw through the deck the first time. So, for example, adding Limit Break makes it harder for us to find the Juggernaut or the Disarm. That could be a problem. 
were offered apparitions. This is an event you'll sometimes see in Act 2. Trade away half of your maximum health to gain apparitions, which make you intangible and basically immune to damage for one turn. This is a run that could take these. They can help with setting up the Juggernaut and such. Um, but I don't think this is a very typical... Uh, an apparitions run is not exactly what I would call typical. So for tutorial purposes, uh, I think I'd prefer to win in a different way than this. But this is absolutely an option. If we took apparitions from here, I'd expect to add cards like Offering, Feel No Pain, Barricade, Big Expensive Powers, and, and Card Draw would all be really, really good. But losing out 50 max health, that's a pretty tough sell. That's a lot of maximum HP to lose, especially when we have such good healing. So I don't think I want to do that. What I do want to do is rest going into the Collector fight. 53 health is a lot, but maybe not enough to survive the Collector's relentless assault here. We don't exactly have a whole lot of energy output, so I expect to have to fight Collector for a while. Um, in that case, we're just going to shore up here. Ooh, we can go Bash Fiendfire, although I don't really like getting rid of one of the upgraded Cleaves all that much. This is really all going to be about using the Juggernaut to, uh, to win. Ultimately, we have to do 282 damage to Collector while mitigating the threat that the Torchhead minions provide. I think I am just going to do this. This does 16 times 3 in addition to removing 3 cards from the deck, so we're, we're just smaller overall, although they are upgraded cards. We've got a spare cleave after all. Alright, these torch heads deal plenty of damage. They always attack every turn, which makes them a bit of an obstacle. Uh, I think it's inadvisable to skip our Juggernaut. This is one of those situations where we just have to, as Ironclad, take a hit to play the power. I think it would also be unwise to skip the cleave. So my preferred turn here is Juggernaut Cleave. Just eat 35 damage to the face. That's partly why we rested. I figured we'd have to have a turn like this once or twice in this fight. Uh, I could consider using the Essence of Steel for a bit more plated armor here. We're going to lose three, go down to one. I'd, I'd like to keep the plated armor to activate Juggernaut. So let's drink this potion. It's true that True Grit would do seven damage to one target, but I'd really like to get all of their health lowered. Actually, we saved two plated armor with that. Yeah, that's a good potion. All right, we definitely want to put Metallicize in play. I'm going to shrug one more card. going to shrug one more card. And we should probably disarm the boss here. All right, Juggernaut, take us home. On turn four of this fight, the Collector always does this mega debuff move, which is going to add weak, vulnerable, and frail to us. That's a pretty big problem. we can get rid of these minions here. Which also draws us two cards with two energy thanks to Gremlin Horn. Each block card is seven damage. Pummel Strike is more than that. Let's just do as much damage as we can here. All right, and the boss is at about half health here. Uh, we have to survive as best we can during these nasty, nasty turns from the Collector. 33 damage incoming because we're vulnerable now, taking 50% more, and our blocks are worse which is a real trouble, but thankfully we have weakness to reduce that incoming damage by quite a bit. Uh, and I think I am going to True Grit here rather than defend. Lose one more card. So we take only eight health we could afford to lose. Meanwhile, we're still putting out a steady stream of damage. Collector's summoning two new Torch Heads. I might want to cleave and then headbutt it for that reason, but I think I'm just going to bash the Collector to apply Vulnerable. I don't know if we're going to kill the Torch Heads again. I guess that's kind of up to Juggernaut, huh? This is tough. That might have been a turn to use the Speed Potion, actually. Um, this is our last turn of debuffs, though, so next turn we'll be free. Let's just finish off the Torch Heads again, because we'll get... It. Oops, uh... We'll get energy and card draw back when we kill them. But now these numbers are much more reasonable. You can see that if we hadn't rested, we'd already be in a critical situation here. So I'm glad that we rested. And now we seem to be through on the other side of things.
Juggernaut is putting out just enough damage to secure the win. Kill the Collector. Get him, Juggernaut. Good work. All right, uh, pretty tough act overall. We really leveraged our huge health pool to kind of continue to gain resources. Got a whole heck load of money there, a Heart of Iron Potion, six metallicize, six block per turn. Something that could serve us very, very well in the late game. And a bludgeon, a demon form, or a barricade. I think it might be time. This deck now has plenty of different block sources. It'd really be nice to be able to keep that block from turn to turn with a, a barricade here. Problem is barricade is a three cost card is gonna be difficult to get into play. If we take barricade, we're gonna wanna find a way to get more energy. Ideally a boss energy relic from our boss here, but we'll see what the options are. Demon form, if there was not a barricade here, demon form could be a nice way to do more damage, kind of scaling in strength alongside the block with the juggernaut. But this seems more self-synergistic to me, the barricade. Never would pick up bludgeon here. Spend all our energy to do a whole bunch of damage, but there's better ways to do that. Okay, and we are indeed offered energy in spades here. Some really good choices for energy. Option A, Velvet Choker. Limits us to six cards per turn, but gives energy a return. The Cursed Key gives us a curse whenever we open a non-boss chest, but gives energy a return. Or the Coffee Dripper prevents us from sleeping for health at rest sites, but gives energy a return. Because we block the next two courses with the Omomori Relic, I think the Cursed Key is the clear victor here. The easiest of the choices for sure. And I think we're in a really good position to limp forward here. Well, maybe not limp. We're, we're actually going to be quite strong in the late game. We've sort of set ourselves up well. We've got many, many pieces to the deck that didn't perform all that well in Act 2, but did perform, are, are going to perform, excuse me, really well in the future. And those cards are the Clothesline and all the powers. The Metallicize, the Juggernaut, the Barricade, the Disarm. These are the key pieces of the deck moving forward. And what's going to kind of work together to get us the win here. We're going to be able to accumulate large amounts of block while lowering enemy strength and dishing out free damage for every time that we create block. It's going to be great. Here in this act, what's our priority here? We've got a few more upgrades. I'd like to upgrade this barricade to be easier to play. It does upgrade to be one energy cheaper. Lots of cards in Slay the Spire upgrade to reduce their energy price, and I think this is one of the, the best ways to, um, to get more value out of your deck. Just play more cards in one turn by having more energy. Um, pretty difficult to fight lots of elites this act. The elites of Act 3 are quite threatening, generally speaking, but don't let this dissuade you from fighting them in Act 3 on a heart run. If you're trying to go to Act 4 and win the whole dang thing, you're going to need to get some more relics in the, the final act here. I think we also want to hit a lot of these rest sites, get a few key upgrades. So let's, uh, let's do something like this. We'll upgrade five times. Well, we have to recall once, so four times. That'll allow us to upgrade the True Grit, the Barricade. We can maybe even invest in like a Shrug It Off upgrade here. And then perhaps one more card that we add this act could also get upgraded. A Feel No Pain, a Dark Embrace, something like that. We get to look at an early shop. Maybe has a power in it. Um, yeah. As far as events versus card awards, generally speaking, events in Act 3 are pretty good, actually. There's a, a lot of very, very useful ones. We could even see... The legendary Mind Bloom offering us a lot of money for curses here. It could be interesting. The Blue Candle, I would do that deal. Our first opponent is Double Spikers. These enemies hit you for damage whenever you hit them. Thankfully here, um, we've got lots of passive block to counteract them. And the uh, Juggernaut will help a lot too. As will, of course, Barricade. So now we get to keep the block. Perfection. And I don't want to play our attacks here, as we're only going to take damage if I do that. Close line, you.
And this should turn into a pretty reasonable heal for 12. Remember, we still got that Black Blood healing us for 12 each fight, um, which is going to really help us this act. Another upgraded clothesline. I think we only need one of those. Don't really want a rupture or a clash. Let's keep going. Rupture with blue candle has some interesting options, but not really. You begin to fall. You have to choose a card to lose here. Defend, barricade, or strike. I do not mind losing my strikes. We're probably going to remove a strike at the shop, too. So two strike removals will definitely help us draw our blocks more and more and more. Oh, Bwaka. We'll block this hit, do the damage. These guys are pretty threatening. They gain strength every turn, as well as adding burns to your draw pile. So you really need to be able to do a lot of damage very quickly for the to deal with the Orb Walker. We still get to benefit from our Bottled Bash that we made in Act 1. It's still putting in good work here, as well as some of the upgraded attacks that we've added so far. Okay, this Iron Wave is upgraded. We have an Oddly Smooth Stone and a Vajra, and it says plus. So this is 8 block, 8 damage for 1 energy. And we have Barricade Juggernaut. I actually think this is pretty decent. Let's pick up the Iron Wave. Oh ho, okay, what a shop. Lots and lots and lots of good things in this store. I'll point to some of my favorites here. Uh, another Shrug It Off gives us more card draw and block. We can upgrade two attacks with Whetstone. That would hit um, probably both Pummel Strikes, actually. That's pretty decent. Potion Belt for more potion slots. I think one of the best ways to defeat Act 4 is to go into it with five potions. So Potion Belt is quite nice. Dolly's Mirror to duplicate a card in the deck could be quite powerful. Uh, I think I would probably duplicate the Juggernaut so that we can do even more damage with our block. Double Juggernaut should be the the end game damage this deck needs. Uh, I think removing a strike is very good, and I think Panic Button, 30 block for zero energy, is also very good. So let's let's do that. I'm going to duplicate Juggernaut here. Uh, we're going to remove one more strike, and then we have 126 gold. Not enough to buy a relic, but enough to buy Panic Button. 30 block. It says we cannot gain block from cards for two turns, but we'll see what that exactly means. It's it's not quite uh, an accurate description of the effect of the, the card. Event versus combat with full potion slots and full health. I think we take an event here over a fight. And we do get offered Mind Bloom. While walking, traversing through the chaos of the Spire, your thoughts suddenly begin to feel very real. One of the most powerful events you can encounter here. There's three very strong options. Fight a boss to get a rare relic. That's always good. Upgrade all of your cards, but be unable to heal. And that, that means unable to heal by any means. No black blood, no end of act healing, no nothing. Or get 999 gold, but cursed with two normality curses. Our Omomori would block that. So this is a free 999 gold. Can it really be this easy? I mean, that's pretty good. We don't have any shops coming up uh, in the immediate future. There is one more guaranteed shop in Act 4. Where we could spend some of this money. Probably not all of it, honestly. Realistically, we might actually be better off with a boss fight. That is pretty good money, too. In addition to the rare relic. Um, and if we take these two normalities, we'll have to get a curse from the chest here. Because we do need to open it to get the blue key, don't forget. Um, but I think either of these are pretty good. I wouldn't recommend the upgrade all. Most of the deck is already upgraded anyway. But heck, can it really be this easy? It's like a thousand bucks. And we're going to upgrade that barricade to make it a little easier to play. Two of our four energy is not too bad. All right, our first elite of Act 3 is the Reptomancer. Reptomancer is a dagger summoning nightmare. However, the Gremlin Horn is really going to pull its weight here by giving us a card draw and an energy every time one of these daggers is killed for any reason. 
Oh, cool. Let's go barricade, shrug, panic button. Cannot gain block for, for two turns, but I get to keep all of this block to next turn. Get him, Kaleev. Kill that one. Draw me cards. Card I headbutt gets put back on top immediately. So let's headbutt Clothesline. Clothesline the Reptomancer here to weaken her. So that I can keep more of this block. So no. Uh, Panic Button says we can't gain block from cards, but we can gain block from non-card sources, like the Plated Armor. Still provides armor every turn. And then the turn after that, we can now once again gain block normally. So let's put all these powers in play. Double Juggernaut, Metallicize. Now we do 14 damage for per block instance, and we'll find that that slices this Reptomancer to shreds actually pretty dang quick. some money. We get a Stone Calendar doing damage on turn 7. I think Stone Calendar can help a lot against the heart, if nothing else. With Barricade, we definitely want to pick up more big blocks. This Impervious is glorious, and uh, we're starting to work towards a really good late-game Ironclad for heart killing here. I think we're going to be in spectacular shape. Uh, let's actually upgrade that Impervious. Ten more block, since we're retaining that block with Barricade. These plus 10 upgrades are a pretty big deal. Even though we get a curse for opening this chest, bear in mind there's two relics inside, and I need to skip one of those relics to get the Sapphire Key. We get the Mummified Hands. Playing a power makes a random card in our hand free. Very good with so many powers in the deck. The curse we got was a Parasite, which will cost us max health if it's removed, but I don't think we'll be removing it. We've got a blue candle. We're also going to upgrade this Panic Button for plus 10 block as well, again with the Barricade. Alright, Transient could be tricky. Transient attacks us for damage every turn, but reduces their damage whenever they take damage. So Transient's usually a combined block and damage output check. And I think the Juggernauts are going to help a lot with that. As is the Mummified Hand. Thanks for making cards free. Heck yeah. So if you can deal 40 damage, or in this case now 50 damage, to this enemy, then you can reduce its damage output to zero. Panic button for 41 block, which we retain. Again, both the Metallicize and the Plated Armor can still give us block while the panic button effect is in play. Kind of funny how that works. Allowing us to continue to accumulate block. It's great stuff. So, in situations where we don't want to draw the Parasite again, now that we have this blue candle relic, we can just play the curse. We take one damage, but the curse is exhausted, and we don't draw it again for this fight. That's what we'll do in most of the late game fights. Since we're healing for 12 each turn, uh, each combat, it shouldn't be a particularly big deal. Look at that damage output. 14 Juggernaut's actually real spicy, like. So many upgraded clotheslines. Again, I think we only need the one. Don't want to add too many cards to your deck. So skipping is skipping is a virtue. Let's lose this Blessing of the Forge, pick up Fruit Juice. Now we're at 105 maximum health. So chonky. And uh, my usual pro tip, highly recommend this if you're on your own heart runs. Recall before you get to the final fire of the run because it's very easy to get to that last fire right before the final boss and think, oh, it's time to rest or upgrade one last card before we go. And then you forget to recall and you're sad. So don't forget to recall. If you're going for a heart win, do take a moment here. Recall the second to last fire. Don't get too excited. Very easy to mistake to make. All right, Nemesis. This enemy is intangible every other turn. Bit of a challenge here.
Don't think we want to play the panic button, because defend, defend already blocks, right? These defends are nine. This is so nice with the smooth stone. All right, Juggernaut, defend, turret. Team fire's free. Nemesis being intangible means it can't take any, well, it can only take one damage from any card here. So we're not really allowed to do big damage to it on uh, on that turn. And now it's another block turn. Close line, defend, disarm, still takes a ton. Do I pommel strike and look for the impervious? Or do we just accept that we're going to lose some health to this huge attack here? 45, one of the most dangerous attacks in the game. Let's just play the Juggernaut. Hopefully this hits Clothesline. It does not. Go Pummel Strike. And either Defend Disarm or Clothesline. Clothesline's going to save more health and do more damage. So we'll lose a bunch, but that's what Black Blood's for, you know? That is what Black Blood is for. Pervy's next turn. I think we get through this fight without playing the Parasite. Also note, against the Nemesis, Stone Calendar actually helps quite a bit. As it kicks in on a turn where the Nemesis is not invulnerable. Looks like we're going to kill them. Just before the Calendar goes off, anyway. The Weakened Fiend... Get him, Stone Calendar. Good work. All right, Nunchaku is a little bit more energy for us. Deck. Oh, there it is, Entrench. Entrench says double your block, and that is the card with Barricade. Especially with a Headbutt. Part of the reason we picked up Headbutt in the early game is to allow us to put a card like Entrench back on top of the deck after playing it. Um... Entrench can absolutely be a way to outscale the late game of Slay the Spire with Barricade. So I really do like this pickup here. Also very reasonable, this upgraded Intimidate for free, more weaken to all enemies. Currently just the clothesline for weakens, not all that good. But Entrench is definitely better here. And we'll want to upgrade that Entrench to cost one with our final upgrade of the run. Or penultimate or whatever. Free bash, oh boy. Kill the one in the back here. I think this is also a fight where I don't have to take the one damage to play the Parasite. We should be able to win this pretty easily. These Darklings need to all die at the same turn, but are otherwise pretty straightforward in how to kill them. Oh my. Cool. Mummified Hand helps us play all of this. I'd love to see it. Cleave. Strike. Could have set up the Nunchaku there, but that won't matter. Here's another key power for the late game. Whenever a card is exhausted, draw one card, says Dark Embrace. Excellent with our Mummified Hand. Excellent with the free upgrade it has. Um, exhaust being card draw is a very, very, very good thing. Works with Fiend Fire, Impervious, Panic Button, True Grit, and so much more. Powers really do make up a, a big part of any late game run. Now we'll have to get past the Awakened One, who does gain power for each, uh, gains strength, excuse me, for each power that we play. But I think if we find that we simply play all of our powers in this fight, that we'll be able to overwhelm this boss. This boss is also very weak to disarm, which causes them to lose three strength right away, so you can really get ahead of the curve. Disarm that boss. Probably gonna headbutt cleave here. The other threatening part of this fight is the two bird cultists. You have to put out a reasonable amount of damage early in this fight to kill these two before they get out of control. It's really not that big a deal. Um, but it's easy to overlook. So let's play cleave twice there. Really chunk their health a lot. All right, remember, we draw a card whenever a card is exhausted. So if I play this Parasite Curse with the blue candle, we can draw a new card, in this case a Defend, which will help a little bit on this turn. Might have to Panic Button this turn, might have to. Let's start with uh, getting Juggernaut in play and seeing what the Defend hits. I 
nothing important here. So we'll lose a whole bunch of life if I don't play this panic button. Now if I do play the panic button, we'll have to take damage next turn. That's almost inevitable, but I think better next turn than this turn. Let's do it. Play the panic button. We even draw a card because it exhausts. That card is Fiend Fire. All right, let's do it. Draw me many more cards. And you need to be weak. Again, we took that clothesline specifically to weaken the late game bosses to make this deck a little bit more effective. And I think it's going to do just fine. Ah, indeed. All right, now we can play the... Oh, whoops, that's right. We're not blocking this turn. So we'll have to take this hit. But we do get to play the barricade at least. And do a little bit of damage. Panic button prevents me from using the impervious there. But like I said, we've got lots of health to spare. I don't know if we want to play both juggernauts. We do want to block with entrench here. Playing the other Juggernaut would give the Awakened One more power, more strength. Let's just block. Since we get to retain our block, as long as we can block for more block each turn than the Awakened One can deal damage, then uh, this will turn into a pretty good thing over time. Yeah, there we go. Specifically with Barricade and Trench, you kind of need to reach a critical mass of block. And once you can block for enough, you're kind of in the business. Good work. Hundred block. This particular combination of cards is also how you can get the 999 block achievements. You just play entrench a couple more times, and we're there. I'll show you. It's definitely the easiest way to get there. Double your block. Just play that one more time and we're there. And the headbutt to allow us to draw the entrench more often is also really essential for a deck like this to be wildly successful. There we go, 999. And we're going to deliberately avoid playing any more attacks. Leaving our nunchaku on 9 means the next time we play an attack in Act 4, we'll gain 1 energy, and that can help us a little bit with uh, getting started there. In general, setting up relics like this nunchaku, anything with a counter, if you can um, spend a little bit of time at the end of a combat to make sure it's set to as high a number as possible, uh, you'll perform a little bit better. So, we're on to the final challenge here, Act 4. Uh, hopefully this run has showed you a pretty reliable way to get to uh, Act 4. We've removed our basic starting attacks, we upgraded key cards early on, we accumulated lots of relics from fighting elites, and we amassed many powers that combined to help us tackle the late game. So only a little bit left. You get one final shop, one final rest site, then you must get through a difficult elite fight before you can finally do battle with the heart. I'm gonna go ahead and upgrade our True Grit here. We're missing three health, but I think that's fine. Upgrading the True Grit allows us to target the card we're exhausting, which could be important against the Corrupt Heart to get rid of status cards, except if I wanna get rid of status cards, here's a better way to do it. The Medical Kit says unplayable status cards can now be played. Anytime we play a status card, exhaust it. There are quite a few status cards added to our deck in the coming fights, so I think this is actually quite good. In fact, we're rich as heck, so we can buy all the relics. One vulnerable on turn one, immunity to the frail status. Uh, we're gonna remove another strike. I'm thinking about buying purity to allow us to exhaust more cards in hand. Um, specifically for the Corrupt Heart, I think a Liquid Bronze to deal Thorns damage could be really nice. Uh, otherwise, the Swift Potion and Heart of Iron are pretty good potions. I don't really think 20 damage or 10 damage to all enemies is all that helpful. 
Um, yeah, so let's buy the liquid bronze, and you know what? Yeah, I'll buy purity. Purity allows me to exhaust specific cards in my hand one time, and I think that's pretty good with Dark Embrace. This will help us get back to the Entrench once we play it, too. Do we keep the curse on purpose? Yes, yeah, actually, better to remove a strike than to remove the curse in this case, because we have this blue candle relic um, that, that we can use to play the curse and get rid of it. It also costs us three max health to get rid of that curse. I don't think I would want to take Sadistic Nature here, although the deck does do a few debuffs and it is a free power. It's ultimately costing us a card draw, which is something we don't want to spend. So I don't think I would take Sadistic Nature here. I don't think we need the area damage of this Ibolate. Um, the Juggernauts will do just fine against the coming fights. Although we might have some difficulty against the Elites here. Spire Spear and Spire Shield. Speaking of, those are our next challenge. These two are pretty dang difficult, I have to say. And they can absolutely stop a run cold in its tracks if you're not prepared for them. Uh, for the final act here, I've got a mod called Bestiary that I'm going to use to pull up. Let's see if this works right. There it is. I'm used to pull up the attack pattern of uh, each of these late game enemies. So, Spire Spear has three different moves. Burn Strike hits twice and puts two burns into the discard pile. On the highest ascensions, these go right into your draw pile. Uh, making this particular maneuver one of the nastiest tricks in Spire. It'll be thrown at you, but we don't have to deal with that on this ascension level, thankfully. So the Spire Spear always starts with Burn Strike. On turn two, always skewers, 10 times four, 40 damage headed our way next turn. Um, and then after that, they alternate between Burn Strike or Piercer, and then the other one with Skewer every third turn. So it's kind of a big attack every three turns enemy. And the same is true with the Spire Shield here. Spire Shield also has three moves. One very big, very damaging attack, the Smash, which is on turn three and every three turns thereafter. Whereas they're a bit more random on the first turn. They either block or attack and debuff on turn one and they'll do whatever they didn't do on turn two. So what that means is that next turn, the shield will always attack us and the spear will uh, for 14 and the spire spear will attack us for 10 times four. That's gonna be a lot of damage headed our way. And we need to figure out how to solve that quick. I wouldn't call this opening hand particularly good. So I would strongly consider using the swift potion here to draw three. Your potions are gonna be a, a major resource for getting through the final couple fights of the run. So trying to get through the act three boss without using your potions is pretty essential if you want to have a really good chance in Act 4. Although if you've got money, you can also use your potions against the boss and then buy new ones at the shop. Something to keep in mind. So yeah, let's use the Swift Potion, draw three more, see what we get here. Okay, that looks a little better. What I don't want to do is play Panic Button on turn one, that's for sure. Let's get down Dark Embrace for our card draw. That made Cleave free, let's play Juggernaut 2. That made Impervious free. Okay, we might as well play the Impervious then. This also draws one card from the Dark Embrace, which is Fiendfire. Okay, here we go. Fiendfire will draw many cards. One per exhausted card, even. So we can look at a whole bunch of new stuff. If we do that, I won't be able to play the Barricade if I draw it, but we can do a whole bunch of damage. I'm thinking we might want to try to kill the Shield first. Triggering, uh, targeting shield or spear first, always a difficult question. Ultimately, the answer is, uh, can you do 160 damage by turn two or 110 damage by turn three? It's easier to kill shield first because the lower health total, um, but it doesn't always work. Okay, we got Metallicize, which is pretty good. We also got Purity. Metallicize will make another card free, which was not, unfortunately, the... Juggernaut. Also something to note in this fight, uh, your character has a facing, you're surrounded. The enemy that you're not facing does bonus damage to you. So we want to end this turn facing the Spire Spear to take less damage this turn. Not gonna use the Liquid Bronze here. Get him, Juggernaut. All right. Unfortunately, this is not really it. Not the turn we wanted here. We we're staring at 60 damage with not a lot of block in my hand. Um, oh, I did get rid of the...
uh, panic button, unfortunately. So I can't headbutt the panic button, which is what I would like to do here. But it's gone. What we could do is headbutt Purity. Draw that with Pommel Strike, and then exhaust a couple of cards to draw a couple more cards. But ultimately, it's going to be pretty hard to do better than Defend and Trench for block this turn. Disarm would be a nice card to draw this turn. But don't forget, we heal 12 at the end of this combat. It's okay if we take some damage here. Actually, I'm just going to head by the true grid. This is slightly more block. So we definitely take some big damage here. Do some plated armor. Ouch. Etc. Looks like we didn't quite kill the shield in time. Not quite. I was really hoping that we could finish this uh, opponent by this turn, but it didn't quite work out. The medical kit lets us play the burns. That's not too bad. Don't know that I can play this juggernaut. I don't think I can. Let's just get the more cards drawn towards our entrench here. Rather play Iron Wave than defend, because it increments Nunchaku. Yeah, we really never quite got what we needed to get here. Only struggling. Come on, one more Juggernaut hit. Come on, one time. Dang it! All right, headbutt the true grit, I guess. So close. Please no. But it's working, though. It's working. We're slowly building up block here. Slowly marking... Actually, Stone Calendar is going to finish the fight for us here. Get him, Stone Calendar. Oof. Never have I been so grateful to have this thing. Yeah, just not quite enough upfront damage in this deck to, uh, to get through the fight. Would have been maybe a little bit better if we'd drawn more Juggernauts turn one. Um, but ultimately, we do survive with a bunch of health. We do get offered a Shockwave to help weaken the heart. And I think overall, we're going to be pretty good here. Sometimes this is what your Act uh, 4 first fight is going to have to look like. You'll have to tank a whole bunch of damage against Shield and Spear to prepare for hearts. Um, but I think we're good here. We've got two good potions. The Heart of Iron is going to be six block per turn. Got a really mediocre turn one, unfortunately. Looks like Iron Wave, Bash, Fiend Fire. Could also skip the turn entirely, but I don't think I want to do that. So, the Heart. Let's take a look at the Heart's pattern real quick here. This is the most difficult enemy in Slay the Spire, and, and merits a, a bit of a, an explanation. This thing has an enormous health total, 750 is more than any other enemy in the game. And on top of that, the heart has a limited amount of health it can lose each turn via the invincible buff. The heart can only lose 300 health in one turn. So no matter how much damage you do, you can't kill this thing in one turn. You must have both a block sword, a block plan and a damage plan to, to beat the heart. Actually, that's true. The transient does have more health than the heart. More health than any other boss, let's say. Uh, so the heart's attack pattern kind of got a, a two attacks and then one off turn cycle. The heart always opens up with a super nasty debilitate buff. You're hit with every status effect in the game, vulnerable, weak, and frail, and one of every status card goes into your draw pile. This is really, really debilitating. And the heart then follows that up with a two times 15 and a 45 attack, which are boosted by the vulnerable to be three by 15 and 67, respectively. 
That's nasty. That's really nasty. And we're going to need some premium blocks to help with that. Um, thankfully, we're immune to the frail. We have some really good upgraded blocks. We also have access to weaken and strength down, and all of these are going to be helpful. So after the heart does its two attacks, which do occur in random order, it then buffs, gaining two strength and a special buff depending on how far into the fight you are, uh, as well as removing any strength down that's accumulated so far. So every third turn in this fight is a buff turn. And uh, where the heart won't attack, these will be our t opportunities to accumulate block with barricade, assuming we survive the next couple of turns. With our reduced health here, we are at risk of dying next turn. Um, well, actually, not. we'll never die next turn, but we could die by turn three if we don't draw enough of our block here. And that could be a real problem for us. All right, so we got rid of some stuff, but we're really hoping to see the block cards. I'd like Dark Embrace Disarm next turn, but that's really up to the heart what I get. Multi-attack is first, and we did draw our disarm. Okay, the good news is we're not dying anytime soon, Twitch chat. We got lucky here. This turn is ultimately why I told us back in Act 1 to take that first disarm. This multi-attack on turn 2 with the status effects, very difficult to deal with. Uh, unless, of course, you have a disarm, in which case you can bring it all the way down to zero. We'll also put the shockwave in play for additional weakness and vulnerable. Uh, and that should allow us to survive long enough to get all the powers in play. Once this deck has every power in play, we should be okay. Bonus points, we get to deal a whole bunch of damage back because we have bronze scales and that potion. So we deal six times 15 equals 90 return damage, which is gonna help a lot here. All right, Dark Embrace, you're just in time. Please draw me one card per card I exhaust here, which is going to be everything. Get all rid of all this. We don't really need basic cards in this fight. The Juggernauts and our Thorns are going to be the primary damage here. There we go. So, Mummy Hand shenanigans. If I play Defend first to get 9 block, then when I play Barricade, the only other expensive card in my hand is the Clothesline. Mummified Hand can't target a zero-cost card, so if I play Barricade, Clothesline always becomes free. Keep that weekend going. And gain 41 block, which I get to keep with the Barricade. Great time to draw the Void. Alright, we managed to avoid this damage entirely. We've actually done pretty well here, then. This, uh, this fight could have gone in a much worse direction for us, but it doesn't seem to have. So let's go Metallicize, makes Defend free. Juggernaut makes Headbutt free. Remember, we can't gain block from cards this turn, so there's no point in really playing the block cards. But I could... Let's just Headbutt that True Grit. Uh, and I don't want to draw yet. We'll let that Defend go for now. Look at that. Ten Metal Metallicize. We're getting a lot of block each turn. And here is Entrench finally to double our block. And this is going to start to take us ahead of the heart, defensively. We're doing just fine now. Defend. Double our block. And then put the doubling of the block back on top of the deck, so we can double block again on subsequent turns. And this poor heart is getting out of here, Twitch chat. S excuse me, YouTube chat. Let's not mention the Forbidden Child. Stone Calendar even comes in assisting there. And yeah, GG. This has been a, a very good run. Hope this has served as an effective Ironclad tutorial. Seeing a, really a lot of the pieces that we put in place really shine in this heart fight here. We actually really decisively stomped the heart with the deck we built. Although we were a bit weak to the elites beforehand, uh, the deck worked exactly as designed. GG. So hopefully this serves as a, a pretty good 
sort of ironclad how-to. With your starting deck lean, damage heavy, trade some blows and rely on your starter relic to heal you up in act one while you accumulate relics and money. Try to use that as a, a way to keep gaining strength through act two while you gradually pick up either synergistic powers or uh, synergistic cards or a lot of powers and then put that all together in the end game to tackle that very very difficult boss hey there if you enjoyed that video watch this one next and before you go join us on twitch and watch live i'm there five days a week playing slay the spire answering questions and chilling with the community click the link in the description to follow right now ta-ta for now